So we've got a great panel, and uh, I'm just going to introduce the moderator, Joseph von Perling. And uh, good luck, Joseph. Thanks for that. My mic's on? Good. Well, we are fortunate today to have some of the uh, great luminaries of the Bitcoin space with us. And I, I could let you introduce yourself because you probably do a better job. And if I think you've missed anything important, maybe I'll jump on it. But go ahead. Uh, sure. I'm, uh, I'm Ryan X. Charles. I've, I've been involved in Bitcoin for a long time. I've, I've worked at uh, BitPay as an engineer. I worked at BitGo as an engineer. I also was the cryptocurrency engineer of Reddit. Uh, I'm now CEO of yours. Uh, it's like Medium with a paywall. Our technology is based on Bitcoin, or well, at least it was until like a couple weeks ago when we had to switch to Litecoin for uh, financial reasons, uh, which uh, I don't know if we'll bring that up, but anyway, for people who saw my talk. All right, I'm Andrew Clifford. I've started off as an investor quite a number of years ago, and I've been a long-term believer in oh, sit on, long-term believer and supporter in Bitcoin. And uh, when Bitcoin Unlimited became an idea out of the gold collapsing thread, I put my hand up to be president of that organisation. So it's 18 months now, and we've achieved a hell of a lot in that time to try and get bigger blocks and on-chain scaling, and we've seen over the last two days a whole bunch of reasons why that has to happen and soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, my name's John Matonis. I'm the uh, Vice President of Corporate Strategy for Enchain. Uh, before that, I was uh, one of the founding directors uh, of the Bitcoin Foundation in 2012. Uh, and I am also on the board of a new digital currency exchange called uh, Globitex in, uh, in Riga, Latvia. Hi, I'm Tom Zander. Uh, I'm a software developer, have been uh, involved in Bitcoin for some years, now working on the Bitcoin Classic uh, software and I'm the release manager there. Hi, is this working? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Leonard Mulder. I'm the head of business development at Bitcoin Vietnam. Uh, we are running the oldest Vietnamese Bitcoin exchange, along with some Bitcoin ATMs in Saigon and Ho Chi Minh. Um, also, we're doing um, remittance services, inbound mostly. Um, and I guess our company is also a pretty good uh, example of how the fees are killing some of the industry players. Wow, thanks for that. Um, I'm just going to reverse the order right now and start with a very broad question about um, the future of Bitcoin. So there's different levels of future. There's the near-term future, medium-term future, and the long-term future. Um, and feel free to address any or all of those as you like. Go ahead, start off with Leonard. Um, yeah, I guess the, the real long-term future, like 10 years in, is very difficult to talk about. Um, but the more near future, which is like two or three years, for me, um, Personally, I think it's it's going to be very difficult to keep on using Bitcoin for all these services. For example, um, at our exchange, the, the the withdrawal costs of the Bitcoin network are actually we're at a point now where they are exceeding the the cost that it takes for our staff to maintain the exchange. So that's a pretty ridiculous uh, thing right there. Um, so yeah, I think for for um, services like the ones that we are providing, um, the future of Bitcoin depends on whether we can pull off a hard fork or not, I guess. From, uh, from my point of view, the uh, uh, hard fork or the changing, the fixing of the block size is something that I worked on a little bit in the beginning. Uh, it was mostly against SegWit, to be honest. But very quickly I realized it wasn't really a uh, technical problem, it was more a political problem and I gladly gave that over to other uh, teams and I've been focusing more on the long term, uh, I think to uh, three to five years or even longer. So what I've been doing in, in Bitcoin Classic is uh, working on um, uh, making sure we get to uh, have a documented version of the protocol because that's basically the biggest problem we have right now. The uh, Bitcoin as it is, is uh, supposed to be a protocol, something you can write on paper, but currently it's not because uh, it is defined as being what 
the Bitcoin Core software does. And, and that's a very dangerous situation because essentially when we fork off a Bitcoin Core doesn't follow, then they have some weird argument to make that says that's not Bitcoin. And of course, many of us will disagree with that because it shouldn't be led by one team. And so I've been working on, uh, for example, the peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol, which is uh, definitely something we need to document uh, because that's what everybody needs to talk. Uh, not, not just the, the uh, full clients, but also the, uh, the companies, everybody. And I've been working on that to make that better uh, in, in, in a way to document it as well as develop it further. Um, there are some other uh, projects on the way that I can uh, uh, point to the website for, for, for more information because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, this was probably the, the highlight. Okay. Uh, yeah, so for the future of Bitcoin, um, once you get out of, of these kind of conferences and you get into the real world, uh, where, where they're not talking about Bitcoin uh, or, or not even following any of the things on, on Reddit or, or on Twitter, um, it, it really becomes a battle uh, of perception for, for, for the hearts and minds of people. And, and, and it is just as much uh, political and public relations as it is technical. Um, that's going to even start to become uh, more and more obvious. Um, it's funny because I have I have relatives in the U.S. who who will call me up when they see that their monthly uh, article in in the Washington Post or somewhere about Bitcoin, and you know they'll they'll say, "Is that Bitcoin thing still a thing? <laughs> yeah, is it still going?" And uh, I think everybody uh, kind of stopped following it uh, in, in the you know in the mass market when it crossed over uh, one hundred dollars for one or thousand dollars for one Bitcoin. You know we're at twenty five hundred right now. Um, and, and people are wondering if it's still a thing. So it is still a very, very small part of, uh, you know, of mainstream life. Um, what, what I want to talk about, though, for the future of Bitcoin is this concept uh, that people bring up about the three functions of money. Uh, we, we have the three functions of money being store value, medium of exchange, and, and unit of account. They don't just all spring on us all at once. The, the, the evolution of a currency is, is not where you get all three at the same time. Uh, these functions of money are, are, are phased in and they're sequential and they depend on one another. Um, they're actually nested uh, with, with the broadest, largest circle uh, being store of value. Um, the original pizza transaction never would have happened if the participants didn't believe that there was store value in the amount of Bitcoin that they were transacting because the recipient would have had to, to hold it for some period of time. So there was that belief in the store of value, which has to precede uh, the medium of exchange function. So that's why it's so critical to treat the store of value and the investors in the Bitcoin network um, because they are the ones who are facilitating uh, eventually the, the other functions of money. Um, after you go past store of value, uh, then you can get into medium of exchange. And I think that right now we're still in the very middle part of what I would call the store of value function. So we really haven't even gotten into the medium of exchange function. Uh, that wouldn't uh, kick off with uh, you know caps of uh, 300,000 transactions per day. That's not going to cut it for medium of exchange function. So we're nowhere near that yet. We, we've only seen experimental medium of exchange, but the majority of, uh, of, of Bitcoin users uh, are using Bitcoin in, for the use case of holding right now. Uh, and that's an investor uh, use case. The third stage being unit of account uh, is very interesting because in Arnhem, we've heard some stories about uh, you're getting paid in Bitcoin and then you're paying your suppliers in Bitcoin. Uh, th this started to happen in Berlin in, in the Bitcoin Keats area as well, where you could charge Bitcoin in your restaurant, accumulate that Bitcoin, and then start paying your employees in Bitcoin, start paying your, your suppliers for the beer and the, and the hamburgers and the bread uh, in Bitcoin. In effect, having you know the... The, the closed loop economy, which is, uh, you know, the holy grail of any currency. Uh, when you get to that final stage of unit of account, it's what economists call um, uh, the numeraire. It's when goods and services start to become priced uh, in the currency. They become priced in the unit. We don't see a lot of things being priced in Bitcoin right now. Even the shops that are accepting Bitcoin they're pricing it in euro and then they're doing some kind of conversion to get it into Bitcoin. So 
that final stage uh, is still quite a ways away for Bitcoin. Um, but you will know that you are there when you start seeing your regular goods and services priced uh, in that numerare. Thanks for that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that was a very comprehensive answer. <laughs> the um, future of Bitcoin really, it is at a crossroads. That There's no doubt about that. I think when most people first heard about Bitcoin, they, they think this is the currency of the future. It's a potential reserve currency for the world. And it was a bit of a surprise when, when the old coin started and gained a little bit of traction. And Bitcoin still had 95% of the monetary base, cryptocurrency money base, a little more than a year ago. So the, the network effect of currency is for everyone to use the same currency because you've got the largest number of users. So unlike most other products, vehicles, aeroplanes, where you can have different manufacturers, there is a tendency for the network effect to draw the users to one cryptocurrency or one currency. So Bitcoin at the moment, at this crossroads, and we've seen the evidence in El Maori's chart just, just now, is hemorrhaging market share from that 95% down to about 50%. And we all know why. We know why, because it's not scaling. So users are not coming along. Now we can see how strong the network effect is because it's still very much alive. The investors believe in it, that there are many people who are fleeing from the fiat currency paradigm. They've seen a new asset class come along. And there's a lot of wealthy people who clearly have invested in cryptocurrency and the market cap for cryptocurrency, 100 billion, is, is actually an extremely substantial amount of money for something that's just been invented in the last eight years. So the future of Bitcoin, I think, is actually extremely good. It is extremely good. And one reason for that is the proof of work. So we have this enormous uh, worldwide collection of computers that are driving the hashing power for SHA-256. That's not going to go away. So what, what Bitcoin's going to do is it's going to work around this problem somehow. And the only question after it works around this problem will be where, how much of the cryptocurrency space it's going to be sharing with the altcoins. That, that's the big question. We're, we're not too late to grab most of that back but probably sometime as early as next year, it will be too late. So the future is at a turning point. And before Mr. Charles, uh, could you take, do me a favor and take that microphone off the table just because it might be picking up vibrations from the table, just to see if that makes it better for the sound. Okay, okay well, I'll on on follow up on a sort of a note you said there just a minute ago, Andrew. Uh, so I, I think that, first of all, I, I think it's important to recognize that it is actually possible that Bitcoin could 100% dominate the entire cryptocurrency space. This has been a little bit underappreciated. Like for those of us that have been in the space for a long time, all coins were a complete joke uh, for years. Uh, there's Bitcoin. Okay, so Craig mentioned this the other day. We have a little bit more to this story. Uh, but uh, uh, my co-founder has done very interesting work on demonstrating the, the deep power that Bitcoin has. Uh, it's much more powerful than people realize. Uh, I think the one megabyte block size limit is uh, is sort of a is sort of a disaster. I mean, we've gotten to the point where it, it it's preventing Bitcoin from scaling. Okay, all the growth is happening in these other currencies for that reason. Okay, there's no re there's no other logical reason why people should be and I I don't mean to offend them or something. I mean it's cool Ethereum and all these other ones. Uh, but I, I think it's just unnecessary, and I think there is there is such a compelling reason to have a single currency. It's extremely useful for end users to not have to deal with some giant array of cryptocurrencies. Let's just have one. We don't need these other ones. It's easier for the users. The only reason why most of these exist is because people are raising money. They realize they can make some new coin, uh, and they can they can raise a bunch of money from people that are speculating in some you know a bunch of different Ponzi schemes for each of these coins, most of them anyway. Uh, so anyway, let me uh, sort of pitch you know, uh, some possibilities here. So one possibility is you know, there's a grand vision for Bitcoin here, all right, which is it could completely dominate the entire future financial system in the world if we let it scale. Uh, the other possibilities are, will we completely miss the boat because uh, of some weird uh, philosophy that some people have in the space that Bitcoin shouldn't be allowed to scale. 
okay? And they'll say things like off-chain scaling, right? The very notion of, of this idea that scaling would somehow be possible in such a manner that's not on-chain, that's not even Bitcoin, right? So uh, uh, anyway, there's, we're, we're kind of on the same page about that, so we're not allowing those people to, to uh, uh, come back at that argument. But it, seriously, like, you know, I, it, the, the very idea that like, we're even calling it on-chain scaling, that is scaling Bitcoin, right? This is how you reach, reach an audience. And I'll just I'll give a few more anecdotes. I said some of this in my talk. Uh, but, you know, my co-founder and I were a small company. There were only two of us, but we spent a huge amount of time building this L2 on Bitcoin, all right? We actually built it, and we're not as famous as the Lightning Network people, probably because I say stuff like this, and so that crowd of people is turned off every time I say this. But, look, you, don't, you can't scale Bitcoin with just the Lightning Network, all right? It doesn't scale Bitcoin by itself. You can run the numbers on this. It's not that hard. One megabyte blocks are the 640, uh, you know, kilobyte limit. Of, of Bitcoin, all right? It completely, like, it's, it's completely insanely low, embarrassingly low. Um, we need far higher blocks. Um, you know, it, so the, the number I ran, I presented this in my talk, was in order to s send a single transaction to 7 billion people, you, it would take 30 years, all right? So it's completely impractical to reach the world. I mean, they can't use Lightning because you got you to have three transactions just to open a channel, right? So uh, uh, anyway, the... I would, I would pitch it this way. So there are two possibilities here. One is we scale Bitcoin, and the other is we don't. Uh, either way, I'm extremely bullish on crypto, and I'm very bullish on the future you know, world financial system. So the question is, like, to what extent does Bitcoin dominate this, and to what extent it doesn't? I think if we do scale Bitcoin, it stands a very strong chance of being able to completely dominate the entire future world, world financial system, largely due to simply the network effect of money. So if we don't screw it up, uh, it could totally win everything. So anyway, uh, 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 you know, go, go bid blocks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, so we heard some. Uh, oh, you have comments on that? Yeah. Um, I'd like to add one thing there. Um, like you said, um, we're uh, we're being outcompeted by altcoins now, in some to some to, to some extent. Um, I'd like to add there that if Bitcoin fails, I feel like a lot of people are going to see that as a failed cryptocurrency experiment. So even if an altcoin might take over in the long run, it's, it's going to take much longer if, if the first mover fails. I think that's worth we've added. So a reduction in confidence from that. Yeah. Uh, so we had good perspectives of, from a business point of view, from a technical point of view, from an economic and a social and practical point of view. Does anybody, the, the point was made that that uh, on-chain scaling is scaling and anything that's not on-chain is, is not scaling. Is there anybody here that would take issue with that argument? Does everybody agree, in the world agree with that? Or, I mean, in this audience, there must be somebody that disagrees, right? Okay, so I'm going to offer you the opportunity to uh, make a comment about that. Well, uh, uh, am, so, I, am I on? Yeah. I think the most important thing is that the, 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 the basis will keep... Uh, free for everyone to use and uh, I don't care too much if uh, the, the layers on top are uh, from uh, centralized companies or something like that as long as people can choose to do transaction on chain and okay for a reasonable price so if uh, is that the transaction costs uh, like a million then uh, we don't have a user case uh, here over here but yeah I do think uh, think that uh, Layer uh, scaling is uh, is also very uh, necessary because yeah, the, especially the the microtransactions uh, will be uh, yeah open up uh, for a lot of uh, use cases. But the market should decide, right? Yeah, exactly. So what then prevents the market from deciding now? In this in this look at the future, we have most of these concern are near case. Well, I think the market is deciding right now by moving to altcoins, which are now kind of our second layer. But if we remove the block size and we can, uh, com we can let on-chain scaling compete with second layers, then that would be a more market-based approach within Bitcoin. But I don't think Bitcoin has a second layer uh, yeah, operational right now, so I don't think yeah. it's fair to... Um, to keep the, the block size limit, it's not fair, no. <laughs> there, there is a little bit uh, of, of a second layer if you think about it because a lot of exchanges do off-chain uh, transactions. So if, if you look at 
uh, a big page uh, and, and, and of course a big blockchain info, uh, Coinbase, they do payments off chain between their users. They're technically speaking not really Bitcoin payments, uh, but they're in Bitcoin, so it's a, a second layer that way. And the yours network is a good example, right? Well, yeah, so let me, I'll just speak to that point. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a false dichotomy that you have to have one or the other. We're, we're not against off-chain scaling for what it's worth. I mean, like, I, I think it's good. That's why we spent 14 months of our lives full-time building, a, you know, off-chain, uh, trustless off-chain payments. So it's a false dichotomy. It's not like it's one or the other. Uh, we can and should have both types of, of scaling. Uh, I think payment channels are, are awesome. I think they have a lot of great use cases. Look, uh, you know, my talk, I said something like, uh, you know, for, for economic reasons, I mean, we need transactions on chain to be something like five cents or less. Uh, but you can do really, really small payments with Bitcoin. I mean, right now, a single Satoshi is a very small amount of money. So in a payment channel, you can send like a single Satoshi to somebody. Um, that's extremely useful. I mean, like, you know, for things like, you know, machine to machine payments and so on. Um, so there, there are all sorts of use cases for, you know, these other layers, uh, side chains too. Um, I think with, 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 uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, on-chain scaling, you, it's still a fully permissionless system, right? You, you, it's just like more open for more, more people to do more things on top of it. If you want to make a side chain and do some other weird thing with it, you're, you're fully, uh, you know, able to do so. Uh, so anyway, I think, you know, it's just, just, I'll point out the, it's not an either or situation. It's a false dichotomy to think about it that way. We can and should have both. Uh, you know, these L2s and whatever should be widely deployed on top, uh, but it's just not a replacement for, for on-chain scaling. Well, and especially with, uh, with Layer 2 for uh, smart contracts. I mean, if we're doing anything with smart contracts uh, in, in the way that Ethereum is doing it, a lot of that will be uh, executed off-chain. The, the key there is that it's settled on-chain, though. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, before the blocks were full, I put a poll on Bitcoin Talk what is a fair price for a Bitcoin transaction? There were about 150 respondents, but there was no real strength in the scaling debate really at that time. And so I think they're honest answers. And 75% of them thought five cents was a fair price. And it was very interesting to hear you say that that was a price that you'd come to a conclusion of. So what happens is that the market can't be fooled. So you just mentioned a million dollar payment on chain in your, in your question just then. And that won't happen because the market will, will put all its transactions onto other alternatives, substitute goods, altcoins, will grab all those uh, transactions. Yeah, there's a little bit of pressure, you know, which we're seeing. So people pay $2 on Bitcoin now they won't be paying $2 in a few years' time because those users will have gone. And fees will be $0.05 cents on the Bitcoin network in a few years if the situation continues. So an early author of Bitcoin Code uh, wrote in uh, one of the comments that there will probably always be free transactions available. Um, that was the past, and now we're in the future of that past. Um, it hasn't proven to be strictly true. Uh, some things that we've hoped for have proved to be true to some extent. Now, we now have a bank that has the ability to take Bitcoin deposits and, and hold them in savings accounts in Japan. Um, if we were to look forward, we have two different ideas. One, where we have the scaling available on chain to support as many transactions as we want. Another, where we don't. If we were to assume that, okay, Bitcoin doesn't fail and and continues a year from now, two years from now, what sorts of things that we imagine today might occur in the next few years? Anyone feel bold enough for a prediction? <laughs> I mean, so banks accepting it. Do you, do you think that we might have uh, more banks accepting it and not just for certificate of deposit type accounts, but for regular savings we, we, accounts we, or checking accounts? Are you saying accounts? that if scaling is enabled? Yes. 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 Then, then we, we should see proper entry into the mainstream economy, in my opinion. Um, the, the wallets, there, there was a comment made yesterday that wallet software sucks. I know people have put a lot of effort into it, and I know Craig has come up with his IP to IP enhancement, which was there at the beginning. Uh, we, we need the, the, the payment 
methods to be very much easier for the average person. And once that is achieved, and the volume problems go away, then, then the mainstream adoption kicks in, in my opinion. Well, I, I think it's uh, actually a lot deeper than that because your question with Bitcoin entering uh, you know, into, the, into the larger capital markets, um, right now Bitcoin is, uh, is a small currency by comparison to fiat. There, there really are no uh, capital markets. There's not even a lot of effective hedging for corporations that uh, keep Bitcoin on their balance sheet. You almost have to either uh, go to bitmex.com, uh, which has futures contracts for hedging, uh, or you have to uh, liquidate what you want to sell uh, on, on your balance sheet. And uh, I, I see this a lot with corporations that are dealing in Bitcoin and, and holding Bitcoin as an asset is, is how do they hedge that? Um, so before we get to uh, Bitcoin in the, in the larger capital markets, we're also going to need to have uh, Bitcoin interest rate markets. And we're seeing the genesis of this right now already with exchanges uh, such as Bitfinex and uh, Poloniex posting, uh, you know, bid offer 24 hour seven bid offer markets for, uh, for borrowing uh, and lending Bitcoin. Um, and those are for overnight rates. So if you annualize those overnight rates, uh, what we're seeing is a very, very wide range in Bitcoin interest rates, uh, somewhere between uh, you know, 10% and almost, uh, in some cases, over 100% annually, which is why people are so enthusiastic about lending out uh, you know, their, their dormant Bitcoin on Bitfinex. It, it sounds great that you can make 100% uh, annually on your money, but uh, what they're not thinking through is that there's uh, uh, you know, supreme counterparty risk in doing that right now. Um, and uh, so it's not so much uh, you know, return on capital, it's return of capital. <laughs> To, to build on that, I think the the uh, idea of of uh, a universal uh, money uh, becomes very interesting as well. The the experiment of Europe and specifically the euro, it, it failed mostly. Uh, well, I'm, I'm probably going a little bit too far ahead in in time to say it's failed. Uh, Greece thinks it failed. I'm sure that uh, the idea is is uh, because the free flowing of money. Uh, helped indeed a lot with uh, shipping goods between countries and, and taking away the borders. But at the same time, the reason Greece failed was because it suddenly became really cheap to get a loan for people in Greece. Uh, and, and, and sorry, but the risk for somebody in a, a nice apartment in Berlin having a, an IT job is just not the same as somebody having a farm in Greece. So the interest rate should reflect that change. And if you look at Bitcoin, yes, we're going to have a much better way to move between countries, uh, which is very simpler, similar to what we've seen the euro accomplish. But at the same time, you can uh, make the uh, payments much more local without there being a, a laws that govern the usage of this money. And so you're going to have banks that can uh, take people's money and, and you know, make them actually, uh, in a safe way we can do with Bitcoin, and make them actually give out loans to companies and, and individuals uh, on a very different basis than we've seen with euros and, and other kind of fiat in a much more sane way. Uh, way that I think is going to be uh, a better way to essentially not get cheated by the banks again, because that's a, a very basic thing we've seen in the financial industry right now. Uh, cheating by the banks, yeah. <laughs> cheating by the banks, the, the, the uh, way they can give a loan to somebody without actually having the money themselves. They essentially just do something in a computer and voila, Fractional that's another... Reserve. Right. Fractional reserve banking is, is, is basically the financial term there. Mm. Can I add something to that? Uh, so this is slightly aside from the specific use cases you guys are talking about, but I just want to mention kind of a you know part of our experience with respect to just trying to do something cool on Bitcoin. Uh, there are all these other applications as well, but uh, uh, I just want to point out that you know this debate for some reason has revolved around this false dichotomy of on-chain scaling versus off-chain scaling. Um, it's so much easier to do things on-chain from the point of view of someone building an application on Bitcoin 
for all these use cases, like pe people will throw out some other way of doing things that's off chain and some hypothetical future thing that involves some giant amount of effort. Uh, when I say it took my co-founder and I 14 months of effort, uh, that's true. That's how long it took us to build a trustless payment channel hub on Bitcoin that works in a web browser. And it's not even finished yet. It's, you know, it's an alpha MVP. And I'm kind of an expert. My co-founder is too, but I'm, I'm even more so just because I've been in the space for so long, have worked at all these companies and so on. So we're, we're experts. We're not new. Uh, you know, and it took us that long to build this. Um, so I just want to add from that point of view, as I was saying earlier, that you can already do so much with Bitcoin if you just let it scale. There just isn't like any logical reason. Let's just allow the people that want to create these new applications to just do so uh, by, by scaling Bitcoin itself without having to find all these weird workarounds. So. Thanks for that good perspective. Okay, so let's take some from, uh, from our group here. We have some of the smartest people in Bitcoin here. Did, did you want to say something? You want to pass it back to somebody else? Uh, first of all, Ryan, I just want to say um, uh, thank you to yourself and Clemens, especially uh, for delaying publication of your paper. Um, and your co-partner, Clemens, who can't be here, I'm sorry, couldn't because he's sick. But um, I'd like you to, I'd like to ask you, what is that paper you're delaying about? Okay. Uh, so uh, we, we, we were keeping it secret, but I'll say because it's just too fun and interesting to not do so, uh, given that question. So, you know, so what my co-founder, Clement, realized, but this is my co-founder. Uh, he knows more about this stuff than I do. He's a PhD in computer science. So take this from something as sort of a, a, I'm a technical person, but not so much an expert in this discipline. But what my co-founder proved was that Bitcoin is basically Turing complete. I mean, it, or, or with respect to, it depends on how you put it. I'm going to, let's see, I'll use my co-founder's term. He calls it effectively Turing complete. Uh, now, what this means, I'll give sort of two points of view of this. First of all, from a computer science view, anybody who's touched computer engineering, computer science, and so on, this seems like a very important property of computers, whether a computer is or is not Turing complete. This basically means, can it compute anything that you might want to compute, or can it not? Well, Bitcoin can. So it's, it's an incredibly important property that it's sort of unbounded with respect to what you compute in, in the Bitcoin script. Uh, so to give a you know, sort of historical analog here, uh, we're all in the crypto space. We've all watched what's happened. We were talking a minute ago about altcoins. Well, the entire thesis of the number one competitor to Bitcoin, Ethereum, is that it's Turing complete. That's the most important property of, of Ethereum. That's sort of why it was invented. Uh, this is the big selling point. This is why it's so cool. It's the world's global computer, and you can do anything you want to do on Ethereum. Uh, but people just don't understand and have completely missed the Turing completeness of Bitcoin. Uh, in fact, I just, I'll, I'll just mention a few other points about this because, again, it's just too interesting to not do. Uh, <laughs> the Satoshi White Paper talked about Bitcoin as a form of money. Uh, you can send and receive this peer-to-peer -peer digital cash, right? The Bitcoin uh, white paper from Satoshi did not even mention script. <laughs> I mean, it's not even mentioned in there. This, this was discovered later on by, I think it was Mike Kern, if somebody with more knowledge can correct me. It was Mike Kern, maybe some of the other developers. I don't, I don't quite remember. But it, it was sort of discovered because Satoshi didn't even b bother to mention it because it was tough enough. I don't know the real reason, but tough enough, I imagine, to explain what the hell Bitcoin was without even mentioning script. So this was just totally missed. Uh, by, you know, the, the script, the existence of script totally missed for quite a long time. And then the genuine power of script was missed. So again, let's put this in context with things like Ethereum, which is Turing complete. It's like the whole selling point of Ethereum. Do you even really need it? I'm not so sure. Uh, what about things like sidechains? Well, why do you need that? Why do you need a Turing complete sidechain if Bitcoin is already Turing complete? It seems like, why don't we just scale Bitcoin on chain? You can do everything on chain. As I was saying a second ago, it's way, way, way easier to... Uh, you know, I mean, imagine trying to convince a user you have to send your money from one chain to another or something, right? Like, it's just, it increases the difficulty of developing it. It increases the difficulty of pitching it. And basically, I think if Bitcoin doesn't do it, one of the other ones will. I mean, Ethereum already has an unbounded block size. You can put as much as you want on Ethereum. And the Bitcoin people make fun of it for being, you know, it's having scaling problems. But the reality is it's scaling better than Bitcoin. It might be clogged, but at least it can fill up, or, you know, at least it can, like, have those transactions. Uh, so uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so the, to answer the question, Bitcoin is Turing complete. It's a huge deal. Uh, it's been completely missed. Uh, and uh, you, know, you should take note of this. 
and understand if we just scale Bitcoin uh, that when I say um, uh, you know earlier that Bitcoin really could 100% completely dominate the entire future world financial system and we don't need any of these other altcoins or any of these other financial instruments like PayPal or whatever, you can do it on Bitcoin. I'm being 100% serious and I actually believe that and we need to scale Bitcoin uh, in order to uh, allow that possibility to happen. And to clarify, when you say it's uh, Turing complete, it basically means we can have an artificial intelligence living in the block size. <laughs> yes. Blockchain, yeah. uh, blockchain. <laughs> blockchain. <laughs> right. So, so th that opens up a whole bunch of possible futures, right? So given the capabilities or, or the claimed capabilities of other blockchain technologies that are already uh, making more use of Turing complete systems, to do other things that foreseeably could also be done on Bitcoin, you can see that the future of Bitcoin might look very different than the past and the present. So if we put on our visionary caps for a moment and project ourselves into the future past the scaling debate and past the figuring out how Turing Complete works into what those sorts of things that money might be used for if it's programmable, what sorts of possibilities does this open up for the longer term future? I, I think my favorite uh, example is still that uh, um, the, the, the uh, problem we have now with house keys or car keys can be solved. Mm -hmm. You uh, can take a picture of my uh, metal key and go to your local 3D printer and have a duplicate within 10 minutes. So, you know, the safety of my house is, is a little bit comp compromised that way. So maybe I can have a little device that instead of uh, taking some piece of metal, uh, it instead just uh, checks if I have a specific private key. And if I move, I just transfer my Bitcoin to somebody else that now occupies that room. Sure, great. What other sorts of use cases? Is yeah, I mean, you, you can you can have all sorts of things you can imagine. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's endless. I think the low hanging fruit is probably going to be in the financial services sector to start with. Uh, you, you know, you've seen things with uh, with, with syndicated loans. Uh, you'd be able to do um, uh, even even uh, smart contract derivatives, so decentralized derivatives with without a central exchange. Uh, you'd be able to have innovations in, in supply chain management. I think where I differ with Ryan on this, though, is I don't think all of those things done in script are going to end up being on chain. Uh, there, there's a logical case to be made because it'll be cheaper to process uh, some of that on, on layer two solutions. Um, one particular example I like, though, was in The Economist uh, magazine uh, recently, and it was discussing the concept, uh, the, the old insurance concept of, uh, of uh, tontines. Uh, does anybody know what tontines are? Where it's essentially where you have this uh, pool that you get everyone together on, and it's uh, like um, it's like reverse life insurance. So a hundred people will put uh, money into a pool anonymously, um, and the last person uh, to die is the one who gets all the money. <laughs> so it's it, it's kind of like insurance for uh, if you live so long that you outlive your savings. Um, and, and, and all of this is possible with uh, programmable money and, and contracts on the blockchain. Um, the Economist wrote up a, a, a very good piece about it because they recognized why it didn't work as a concept in the 1800s. Uh, it, it first came out in the 1800s and uh, it wasn't anonymous, so there were, of course, murderous plots to kill people so that <laughs> you could be the last one. Now, if you're able to do full anonymity for tontines uh, on, on, uh, uh, on life insurance, um, you know, then that's something that you would, I would seriously consider using that as a product. To, to be the, the last man standing and outlive my savings. <laughs> hey, that's a good incentive for helpful living. And, and there will be a, a company very shortly that, that comes out with this. Um, huh. I, I know of several that are already investigating. Oh, that's fascinating. All right, I, I can't help it. I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I'll, I'll give my, my vision <laughs> sort of here for the future for some of these uh, sort of other applications. Uh, I think that... Uh, uh, you know, I'm a I, I'm a very deliberately forward-looking person. I, I like to think about you know sort of the future and, and uh, things we can do in the future that that are physically possible. 
uh, that, that we can't do today, but it's possible to imagine building the technology and whatnot that you can. There's a lot that you can do with uh, programmable money, with money that uh, you don't have to have a social security number or whatever, whatever the European uh, equivalent of that is uh, in order to be able to get a, get a bank account or something like that because machines – can, uh, can, can do it. They can possess and they can send around money. You can have a computer that can do these things. Uh, so I think a really cool application is basically just AI. And this is something that's been talked about quite a lot in the, in the crypto space because it's so cool and interesting. Uh, well, I think it's pretty cool and interesting. I mean, I think it'd be really awesome to have AI that can earn money uh, and spend it and you know, survive itself. Uh, you, know, you can imagine something like a self-driving car, uh, which is not just self-driving, but it's self-owning and it earns money by taking people around and it buys its own gas and whatnot. Uh, the, the expense would be extremely low because it has like no overhead. It doesn't have to pay a driver. Uh, it's basically just the machine itself, which is pretty cheap. I mean, you can buy them for you know, thousands of, a few thousand euros or whatever for a car. Once the, you know, the programming and whatnot is just software, it's code, you can copy it. It's gonna be completely commodity. So the, the cost of like taking one of these things around is gonna be extremely minuscule. Uh, so anyway, that's a cool idea. I'll just I'll leave, sort of leave it at that. But I would say that's what I think is the most interesting long-term possibility here are uh, – well, let me just – I'll add one more anecdote. Think about this just a little bit. How big is that economy going to be compared to the human economy? You know, people talk about how, how big should Bitcoin be and how are we going to scale Bitcoin. Uh, Craig said the other day 5 billion people. I said 7 billion, but I think he's right just because you, know, you don't have to include the children because they're not all <laughs> economic agents. But – the number of machines that can exist is a lot more than 5 billion. It's way, 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 way more. And again, I'll, so I'm a former physicist, so I like to think about the actual physical limits of things. The number of economic nodes you could have in the world is a pretty ridiculously large number, right? I mean, what you're real, really limited by is actually the speed of light. Uh, you can't, you know, you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time to perform economic you know, transactions or whatever with people in other star systems. But if you're all on planet Earth, there can be a rather ridiculously large number of economic agents. I mean, just to put sort of a, sort of a picture of, a, of what a number would be on this, just consider how many insects there are in the world. It's whatever, however many millions of insects there are per person. There's no reason why you couldn't have just as many robots, and they could all be economic nodes paying each other in Bitcoin. So that's, I think, the most interesting uh, long-term application of Bitcoin. Sounds very scary to me. Yeah, well, let's, let's hope that, yeah, right, the scary part of it is that the, these, uh, these economic agents of the cars buying other cars, let's just hope that the humans are the early adopters, and <laughs> that the, the robots get in robots a little later. Yeah, hello. Yeah, there we go. Um, robots still have to trust So us. you mentioned that the uh, strongest network effect for Bitcoin is um, as money, as a unit of count, because people don't want to use, you know, multiple cryptocurrencies, it gets confusing. I would disagree with that because of the nature of the technology, in that um, in, because of interoperability, we're able to seamlessly transact between cryptocurrencies regardless of what cryptocurrency anyone is using. So I would argue that the strongest network effect is, uh, is actually security in this case and um, um, not, not, not this effect that you're describing um, for that reason. Well, uh, just, just a quick answer to that. You, you, you are right, uh, but Bitcoin does have both with the, uh, with the hashing algorithm we're using now is definitely the strongest security. And the seamlessness, the interoperability, um, that does remain to be seen. I mean, we, saw, we heard about Polkadot yesterday, and we could have Polkadot coin potential from you know, the seamless meta coins. Um, but again, it's another layer, and, and it makes programming more complex, and it's probably a few years out. And Bitcoin only needs a few more years to really accelerate the network effect. We've lost time. We've lost a couple of years. We should be a lot bigger than we are now already. And and the idea that that you know 100% uh, market domination, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Purely just because of the diversity of belief of people, and I think people will have different ideas about what an ideal economic model is, and and, and the interoperability further also aids that effect. I would argue. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah. so uh, I think uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I think you're making a fair point. Uh, I think. I think it's probably the case that actually network effect does matter the most, and I actually think it probably is uh, really important for Bitcoin security. I mean, I think the security would decline uh, if Bitcoin's popularity decreased. So there's clearly it, – maybe it doesn't matter at the end of the day for Bitcoin specifically just for that reason because the economics or the, the incentives are so well designed that they're, they're pretty linked. Uh, but I do think that money has a strong network effect. I would just say uh, – 
I hate to use this this phrase, but Google it. Like, you know, there there are there's a lot of arguments, and I say that mostly because it's it's not really like my area of expertise. But there are, there are extensive arguments I would point you to that talk about how ne you know, money is, has a very strong network effect. Uh, to some extent, though, it's kind of an experiment, and, and it's not the case that we currently have a world currency. We, I'm not sure it's even really fair to say we've ever had one uh, in the world. I mean, the strongest case you could make would be for gold, but I think it was Craig saying the other day that uh, actually I'm not sure we've ever even really had gold because if you think about it, what do most people actually use? Well, they actually use some type of substitute. They, they use certainly in, in modern years it was fiat currency, or not fiat. It would have been you know, paper uh, backed by gold. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's kind of an argument, but I, I think you're making a fair point. I'm not really sure, so it's kind of a, I would I would just leave it open and just say that uh, we'll sort of see how it plays out and see whether that that vision happens. Well, give, give me a chance then. I, I I didn't I didn't hear it as a question, but I'll offer my answer anyway. Um, the uh, it I do believe it has a very strong network effect, but. Um, if you compare uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to national fiat currencies, there's about 155 or so national fiat currencies. The only reason that there's 155 instead of the world you know, gyrating to one or two is because of the artificial political boundaries. So that's not, uh, that's not a fair comparison if, if you're trying to compare it to the crypto world. If you're looking at it among the 963 cryptocurrencies that are circulating, the natural tendency with, with any open global uh, network effect or value transfer protocol, which is what Bitcoin is, is that the world will, will naturally gyrate uh, to, to uh, one or a few. Um, that, that's just the laws of nature. And, and, and the, another way to look at it is with, uh, if, if Bitcoin is measuring value, uh, which it is, Bitcoin is not wealth in itself, it measures wealth. Um, we don't have, uh, for, for measuring temperatures, we don't have 600 different ways to measure temperature. We have Fahrenheit, we have Celsius, and we have Kelvin. Maybe there's a fourth one uh, that I'm missing, but we basically have three ways to measure temperature. The world doesn't need 600 different ways to measure temperature, and the world is not gonna need 600 different ways to measure value. Um, even languages across the world are, are, are coalescing to, f to just a few languages. We're, we, every year we lose about 100 languages in the world. I, I would like to add something there. Um, you said that um, because of the, the easy interoperability between the cryptocurrencies, it's very easy for somebody to, for everybody to uh, converge to one currency, but I, I think that's a bit of a double-edged sword. So they might as well go the other way because of the ease of well, I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I wasn't saying which would win. I was just saying that it would it would naturally evolve to a few. Right. Actually, I agree there. I think there's going to be a big few, and some of the smaller ones. A lot of the smaller ones are going to die out. But I don't think it's a, a winner takes all situation. But yeah, a couple of big ones, I guess. I, I have a, a counterpoint to um, to your point here, which is I think there's a mental limit. You know, even though there's seamless interoperability, like the average person is not going to be able to keep in their mind 30 different cryptos that are functioning just as money. And uh, so I think one to a few is, is the mental limit. I think, I think for these individuals, uh, I think you're right, they're not going to have 30 different types of money, but there'll be different people that value different types of money in this case. And you, you use the, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, fiat currencies as an example. Uh, you know, through the history of, of, of money, a lot of the time uh, we're forced to use a particular fiat currency. And now we're in a case where we have the freedom to choose. And I think that people will make different choices. And for some people are Ethereum maximalists and some people are Bitcoin maximalists and, and so forth. And as long as that is true and as long as we have that diversity of a belief, I think, I think that's going to take a long time to converge. I think the point is a bit more of when we say we have Bitcoin taken 100%, it's that 100% of the population using money will support and, and be able to transact in Bitcoin. So, it, sure, they might have something else and, you know, their kids in school might start their own coin. I think the main reason why we would have more than one is if we move to Mars because the system doesn't work uh, between planets. So then we have two coins and an exchange between them. Okay, I'm going to just make a totally different uh, viewpoint than all you really smart people. But, I mean, I really, I mean, John, you mentioned we're not at the stage yet where it's even being used as currency. And I know you guys all see the, the full blocks is, is exactly why all the money's 
going to the other currencies. And I can't help but think that might be part of it, but I just see so much speculation, not money, speculation, people wanting the next Bitcoin. You know, Ethereum had gone up like crazy over a year ago already. And um, I just can't help but think that's part of it, that it's not just the financial, I mean, the money properties. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, Ethereum's only use case is, is for buying ICOs, really. I mean, I don't know any other thing you can do with Ethereum. I, That's I, the killer app for Ethereum. I disagree there. I don't want to, again, I don't want to be a, an Ethereum shill here. But, um, I mean, as of now, the Ethereum network is very secure and the payments are faster and easier. So there's a use case, money, right? But, but what transactions are being done with that? Well, I know a lot of people that are doing transactions, and if, actually, if you look at the chart, there are, there are being more transactions done right now than there are in Bitcoin, I believe, on Ethereum network. Amazing, yeah. uh, but not for, not for buying things. Not I don't for, think. For how do you know that? <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't see sure. Bitcoin okay. payments <laughs> being made either. Okay. Wait, we got. Let's stick with someone with a mic. I know every. There's a lot of. Talk. <laughs> Can you restate that on this, please? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, right. so, 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 so we've got a problem in that we're 20 minutes past our deadline. We're going to have to be at a restaurant pretty soon, and everybody wants to talk. I don't know how everyone's feeling about keeping this going. Obviously, it's a great discussion, but um, there are a few people who've had their hands up for a while. Everyone's into sticking around? Okay, we've got someone here. Someone there's had their hand up for a while, so try to talk on the mic. Okay. Sorry, but I'm going to have to pull the discussion away from the obvious Ethereum-Bitcoin comparison debate here. But uh, I just want to make one uh, comment on one of the future visions which Ryan gave, which I think is really, really relevant, and maybe a lot of people have, haven't really thought about the ramifications of, which is if we do have machine-to-machine -machine payments, and we had an economy which was, what, 10, 100, 1,000 times more than the existing possible economy between human agents, then wouldn't that be a perfect case where humans, being the ones that designed the machines, take a small cut tax, as it were, and then we have basic income for planet Earth? Just from. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the, the machines serving the humans, there's a, there's a good uh, future. You know, if, if the, there is a collapse of use cases, if all the use cases sort of come into the same cryptocurrency, and if that is Bitcoin, um, we may see some of that coalescing between the different options. You had a question like that? Or? Yeah, so when thinking about uh, on-chain scaling, uh, and especially when I heard things like 100% uh, dominance of global finance for Bitcoin, uh, which I surely hope as a Bitcoin maximus, um, <laughs> However, you know, with the current uh, one megabyte block size, there's about seven transactions per second limit. Um, with the proposed, various proposed uh, solutions, we can double that or quadruple or even go tenfold. However, if we ever even want to compete with uh, Visa and MasterCard, let alone replace them, uh, we need to go up at least a 10,000 fold, if not more. At which point, I mean, at some point, we are going to run into trouble, right? Or do you see no problem there? The the uh, actual numbers from I think uh, it's it's not that long ago was like fifteen hundred transactions a second, uh, on average for Visa. The maximum is of course quite a little, lot higher, but we're not talking about that right now, uh, because we have mempools we can do those uh, things, and the actual numbers are really not that scary. I mean, you know, most people don't realize. Uh, the, the, the good old joke of, of MS-DOS 640 is enough. Do you realize that one megabyte is only a tiny little bit bigger than that? And if I download or watch a Netflix movie, I download it uh, one and a half gigabytes on my home connection. It really isn't scary 
if you look at the actual numbers? Sure, I always say um, once the one megabyte limit was installed, since that moment, I mean, everybody's internet connection and storage space has been gone up many factors and the block size limit hasn't. But still, um, do I understand correctly that you think even if 100% of all global payments would go on the blockchain, it's still not a problem? Okay, that's a great question. Even if 100% were on the blockchain, is it still not a problem? I'm going to get an answer from everybody. And then um, my stomach is grumbling. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> but once someone talks about food, I start to think about it, and everything else is distracting. So I want to hear if everything's on chain, what else can we do? Okay. Uh, let me, uh, I'll just first say, I mean, that's a fine sort of question. Uh, but I'll just say, that, as I was saying earlier, it is a false dichotomy to think it has to be one or the other. Uh, just be, even if Bitcoin is the sort of the, the you know, foundation of the future world of financial system, it doesn't mean literally every transaction of any kind whatsoever is always an on-chain Bitcoin transaction. Uh, there are other things you can do. These other layers can and will exist. Could it be, be on-chain? Yes. Yes. Yes, I, yeah, the, but not there you how. go. Let me, but let me, and I do think the answer is yes, okay, even if you could. I, I don't think it will, though, because like some, I think maybe John was to say, like it's, it's going to be cheaper in some cases to just not. Uh, it doesn't mean fees are going to be zero necessarily. Um, but to just back up the point, though, there's another thing. Again, I think this has been like largely missed in the debate, so it, it deserves repeating. Um, today, you can buy a computer that can process like the world's transactions on Bitcoin. I mean, like it's it's not some weird, impossible goal. Uh, it is absolutely doable today with technology that's currently available, and the only problem is it's a little bit expensive. Oh, that's great. Now, Mr. Clifford, would you want to respond to that? Yes, I think the, the other thing is to think that we're, that's still 20 years out, you know, assuming previous growth. And Moore's law is, is still holding true, and there's a number of other laws for, for bandwidth and, and other things. So, so we're not talking about taking ridiculous volumes today, and as we've just seen, some, some of the machines today have, have, have good enough spec. But it's a problem for tomorrow. Let's deal with today's problems. Mr. Right. Yeah, I, I, um, I would say that uh, it, theoretically uh, it, it would be possible, but not today. And the, asking the question is a little bit like, the uh, you know the person who said we're not going to be able to get everybody having a phone on the internet. Uh, we're only at the period of time of uh, you know 1994, 95, uh, or earlier with respect to Bitcoin. So we don't know the answers that are going to come up. Uh, one of the things that uh, Vitalik said about Ethereum is that um, he spends a majority of his time, 80, 90 percent, figuring out uh, solutions to sharding, um, and and whether that's possible or not. Uh, a lot of people don't even think it's possible. So we don't know the answers now on, uh, uh, on the way to solve this, just like they didn't know the answers on how you'd get everybody on the internet with a mobile phone. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Mr. Zander, closing comments on the future. The, um, the idea of, of putting everything on chain uh, depends a lot on, on validation speed, and this is something I've been researching quite a lot over the last couple of months. Uh, first of all, I, I did a blog based on a, uh, a video uh, that Roger Ver of Bitcoin.com made where he basically did a run of uh, doing a first blockchain, which is validating all the transactions, actually counted how many transactions he did, etc. And um, I think we've gone in a year to uh, take that, that, that number we had back then to almost 10 times as many because the software just wasn't you know, optimize for it, and, and I've been optimizing, and other people have as well. And so the, the speed with which we are increasing is also quite impressive. So doing the validation, doing the, the sending of data, and all that stuff, it's not going to be today, but we have like 10, 20 years to reach it. I, and I'm really sorry. Um, the organizers are telling me we're a half hour behind schedule, and we got to get to dinner. So I'm, I apologize, unless you want to say something for like, 30 seconds. Uh, just really fast, okay, the, the question, I guess it's, it's, an in, it's an interesting question, it's not for me because I'm not very tech savvy, but it's for me it's an irrelevant question because either we can or we can't, doesn't matter, we should push for it because it's, it's the best thing we have right now to push for. Thank okay, you. so that was some great food for thought. Let's give him a hand. And food for the body next. All right, you guys.